Hello everybody, welcome to Indie Friendly TV. I'm the Friendly Indie, or at least I try to be. And in this first video for the channel, I wanted to do something, I wanted to cover something that was pretty hard for me to get, uh, get good at, or at least, you know, serviceable at, when I was starting my game dev journey. And that is creating characters. So, I don't know about you, but I'm not much of a drawing person. I, I can't really draw very well. So I needed to find a way to design characters without the concepting phase, really. So I, I needed to learn how to concept in 3D. And in this video, I'm going to try and show you how you can really quickly start sculpting your own characters. Okay, so we're going to start with a cube and we're going to end up with this. So it's going to be a super simple character, nothing too fancy, just a guy, and we're going to use Blender. So I think that's enough talking for now. Let's get into the video. All right, guys, we're going to start with a fresh scene here. And the first thing we're going to do is delete the light and the camera. Awesome. So whenever you're starting a new sculpt, it doesn't matter what the subject is, you need to break it down into smaller, more manageable components. And those components are going to represent the volumes and the masses of the sculpt. And to make them, we have to start with simple geometric shapes. So in our case, we're making a head, which means a couple of spheres stacked on top of a cylinder for the neck and a kite-like shape for the top of the torso. So let's start by making the spherical shapes first, okay? Now, your first instinct would be to actually just start with the sphere. So let me bring that in. Now the problem with this is that, let me turn on the wireframe. The problem with this is, as you can see, the top and the bottom are both triangulated poles, right? And what that does is it creates like these weird pinched areas on the surface of the mesh. And you don't want that. You never want to be fighting with your mesh when you're working with it. Okay, so so what you want is this band in the middle, something that is evenly laid out and four-sided. Okay, so instead of using a sphere, I'm going to delete that. We're going to instead use a cube and turn that into a sphere. So select the cube, hit Control-2, and that is going to add a subdivision surface modifier with two levels. So that's Control-2. Control-3 adds a subdiv-3 modifier, and Control-4 adds a subdiv-4. Now we're going to go with a level 2 modifier because that is that has enough points to represent the shape that we want, but not too many that it bogs us down. And you're going to see this later when we're sculpting. The more polygons you have, the more difficult it is to control the surface. Now control 2 only adds a modifier to the list, which means this thing that you see here, it's not actually a sphere, it's still a cube. Blender is just giving us a preview of what it's going to look like when we apply it. So I can just hover over this modifier here and press Control A. This is a new feature in Blender 2.9. If you're using previous versions, uh, you're probably going to have like a button, apply button right here. And in 2.9, you can also find the apply option under this drop down menu. And now it's actually a sphere. So I have access to the components inside it. All right, in object mode, duplicate the sphere with Shift D, move it up a little bit just enough so that the bottom part is still intersecting with the original sphere. Now this is going to represent the cranium, so we need to give it an oval egg-like shape. And I'm going to move it back a little bit. All right, so at this point, I'm going to recommend that you guys watch a video uh, by Steve Houston. He's an amazing artist. He covers, in that video, he covers uh, the head construction, how to simplify and really quickly create the head and uh, it's, it's a video about drawing the head, but, you know, fundamental principles like that, they can always translate into any medium that you want. So whether you're painting or you're sculpting or what, what have you, you know, it, it can always apply all across the mediums. Now, one of the things that he talks about is this shape for the head. It's kind of like this triangular guitar pick shape. Now, the important part of this is this point right there. Now, this represents the turning point between the front mask of the face and the top plane of the head. So there needs to be a clear flow to the back here and a clear flow downwards in the front. So in order to do that, we need to use the sculpt mode. So I'm going to select both of these guys, hit Control J, 
and that's going to join both of them together into one object. They're still both overlapping each other. They're separate meshes, but they're part of one object now, which means now I can open the radial menu with control tab and go to sculpt mode. Now you may have noticed that in sculpt mode, we have a different set of tools. These are all brushes. I'm going to pull out this bar here so that if you're new, you can actually look at the different names of the brushes. Okay, so I'm going to take the grab brush here and use the F key to affect the radius of the brush. So this controls the area of influence. I can start pushing and pulling the points. Now the problem is that it affects the cranium and the jaw at the same time. And I want to be able to affect them separately. So what I can do is go up to options and under auto mask, I can choose topology and what that does is it only affects something if it's connected to the point that I'm manipulating. Okay, so the cranium in this case is not connected to the, to the jaw and so it's not going to affect the jaw. Now the other option is to use face sets. And right now we don't have any face sets, so let's apply them. Let's go over to the face sets menu and under initialize face sets, let's choose by loose parts. And that is going to apply a different color, a different face set for the parts, the loose parts of the model. And now it functions pretty much exactly like the topology option up here. All right, so let's go ahead and push and pull these points into the shape that we want. And that was a little too far back, so let's pull that up. Now you can have all different kinds of shapes for the face. You don't have to stick to the Disney formula. You can try your own completely unique kind of faces. So round shaped faces, heart shaped faces, rectangular, triangular, parallelograms, whatever flows your boat, just go ahead and try it. In this case, I'm trying to make a young male character. So I, I'm going to go with like a chiseled jaw. So more of a rectangular jaw with a little bit of a, a taper at the end. Now you really don't want to hurry through this process. This is a very important step. So don't don't like try and blaze through it. Give it enough time and everything will fall into place. Now, one of the important parts that we should be paying attention to is right here. This is supposed to be the eye line. Okay, so I will place the eye somewhere on this on this line. So just make sure that this divot right here is very apparent to you. Okay, All right. So just making sure that the front is clearly delineated from the top making the plane change really apparent by flattening the top of the head. So now we can actually see that this part here is the front and from here onwards, it's the top of the head. Now let's head back to object mode and add a neck. We're going to start with a cylinder this time. And for this guy, I'm going to turn down the number of sides here to 16. And this is because when I have like 32 sides, it, the faces are way too small when compared to the faces on the head. So let's set it back to 16. And we want to try and always get an even distribution across the whole model. Just scale it down, move it into place, and scale it up to give it some length. All right, I'm going to hit tab to enter edit mode and control R for the loop cut tool and use the mouse wheel or the page up and page down keys to enter uh, to you know increase the number of cuts so I just want to add enough loop cuts to make them look you know close enough to squares and I'm going to select both of these meshes and hit Control J and now I'm going to move it up a little bit I want the center point of the model to correspond with the center point of the world when I add the torso into the mix as well now let's head back to sculpt mode and shape the neck now the thing about the neck is that it actually slopes forward a little bit. It's not straight up and down like this. So from the side, the base is not straight like this either. It's at an incline, all right? So the neck actually flows into the head like this. So let's just really quickly uh, shape the neck. Now what I'm also gonna do, and this is very important in terms of design, is that I'm gonna add a taper at the bottom. It's going to be a little thicker at the top and it's going to get a little narrow at the bottom. Now this is a principle that you really should apply in every artwork that you do. Now simple straight lines like this are kind of boring, but when you give it a taper, it becomes a bit more interesting. Okay, so the, the, the driving principle behind this idea is contrast. 
So straight lines like this, they don't have any contrast. And something like this does, okay? So the top here is longer than the bottom. So contrast is very key to giving your art. It doesn't matter what you're making, whether you're sculpting, painting, drawing, uh, graphic design, wh whatever you're into, it is, very, it is a key component in making your art visually appealing. So it's not even limited to visual arts. This is a concept applied to like music and, and writing as well. So try and add contrast wherever you can. Now, I, I don't know about you, but it kind of freaks me out if I don't have like ears on the model. The ears are very important for the orientation of the face and they also add a lot to the silhouette. And, and when I don't have that, it feels just very wrong to me, like something's missing. So really quickly, let's go back to object mode. And this time we're going to start with a plane. So rotate that 90 degrees on the X axis like this and rotate that on the Z axis by 45. I'm going to move it, scale it down and position it roughly where it needs to be. So I take the simplest route to create the ears. Um, they can be pretty complicated. So I, I simplify it for myself. Press control two. And that's going to subdivide the mesh control a to apply and that gives us like a, a circular basic round shape for the ear and then i'm going to apply a solidify modifier and increase the thickness a little bit yeah that should be enough and then i will apply a mirror modifier now the mirror modifier by default it mirrors across the center point you you see that dot you see that that's the center point it, it mirrors across this so right now it looks like it's not doing anything because it's a perfectly round shape and even if it's mirroring across the the center line here it's going to look like nothing's happening so what we need to do is select this and we need to apply the transforms that we've done Control a to open the apply menu and i'm going to hit all transforms here and that moves the center point to the world origin and as you can see we now have the other year as well now obviously the solidify modifier needs to be adjusted a little bit so let's turn it down okay let's go back to sculpting now and adjust the shape of the ears now like i said ears are a pretty cool way to break up the silhouette of the face and they can be like super expressive as well so uh give your characters some interesting ear shapes I'm going for a Ron stoppable kind of year right now. I'm, I might change my mind. It's just, you know, what I'm thinking of at the moment. I, I don't really have, I'm not working off of a, a concept here. So I'm just trying out different things. Now, right now I can't change the back side of this because the back is just a preview. If I turn off the preview, you'll see that this is the only thing that I can work on right now. So to work on the back, we need to apply the solidify. But for now, I just want to make it simple for myself and only, um, only work on the front side here. Okay, if you find that your mesh is becoming like this wobbly mess with like edges being distorted like this, what you can do is, is hold shift and gently tap the surface and it's going to slowly correct itself. If you go too hard, all the, all the things, that, all the forms that you built up, it's going to obliterate all of that detail. So if you want to be careful with it, just gently tap the surface instead of, uh, instead of using it like a normal brush. Okay, let's turn that back on and work on the shape a little bit more. Maybe something like this. I would like something that kind of sticks out when, when you look at it from the front. So something very prominent. Now, one thing I want to talk about is the focal length of the camera. So right now, if I hit N, that's going to open the sidebar. I'm going to hit to view. And the focal length of the view right now is set to 50 millimeters. So 50 millimeters is a pretty standard focal length, but Portrait photographers, if you uh, ever look at their work, they tend to use 85 millimeters and above. And that range of focal length, uh, you know, 85 and above, that makes your pictures, especially if they're portraits, they look a lot more appealing. So I'm going to enter 85 here, 85, hit N to hide the sidebar again. 
and as you can see it's much more flatter looking so for a portrait I think this is a this is a better way to work okay so now that we have the final ear shape or as close to final as we can get in the block out phase let's head back to object mode and then select both of these and join them but before I do that I have to keep in mind that the ears actually have the modifier stack still active and they're not applied and and that can cause some problems if I don't apply them and join both of them together it can actually affect the head model as well so if I press Control J now you will see that the solidify modifier and the mirror modifier are both no longer in effect so I'm gonna undo that and the reason why that happened was because of the order of selection so I selected this one first and then I selected the head and that makes the head the active object so whatever you select last becomes the active object and when I join them it takes the modifier stack of the active object and uses that so as you can see the head doesn't actually have any modifiers and so when they're joined they get removed from the ear as well but if I selected in the reverse order you know the head first and then the ear and I press Control J you can see that it's doing some wonky stuff to the head and if I press shift Z to show the wireframe you can see that there's another mesh inside the head as well so this is the solidify modifier at work so we obviously don't want stuff like this to happen it can cause some problems so I'm gonna undo that and make sure that we apply the modifiers first before joining them okay with that taken care of let's uh, add another cube and uh, this is going to be our torso or the top of it so let's uh, let's scale it and position it in the correct place yeah I think that should be good enough and since we scaled it uh, non-uniformly as you can see it's not it's not uniformly scaled here we need to apply the scaling so control A and hit scale and now I'll press control 2 for the subsurf modifier with a level 2 let's hit tab for edit mode I will not apply the modifier right now I will go to edit mode instead because it is easier to uh, shape this into like a very rudimentary shape for the torso when it's in this when when it's in the cube form because the cube is super simple it's easy to adjust and scale it horizontally here and now let's go ahead and apply this control a head over to sculpt mode and let's work on getting the shape that we want I'm trying not to make him look too muscular uh, I think that should be pretty obvious I don't have exactly you know the character that I want to make uh, but maybe I will go for like uh, a high school student or a college student or something like that not I'm not looking to make like Dwayne the Rock Johnson so a question a lot of beginners ask is do I need a pen tablet to do this stuff so you can technically do this without a pen tablet you could do this with a mouse um, but it's like using a bar of soap to draw or paint you could technically you know stick a piece of lead at the end of a, a bar of soap and you could draw or you could you could dip that into a bucket of paint and you can paint with it but it's not the the recommended tool for those activities no one is going to praise you more if you use a mouse to sculpt okay you're just making it hard on yourself the only people you'll impress will be like masochists so if if that is your target demographic then go ahead but otherwise invest in a tablet it can be like the cheapest thing that you find it can be a secondhand Chinese knockoff with like footprints on it as long as it works as, as long as it it has pen pressure you can benefit from that and I would definitely recommend that you get it awesome and with that we have a simple base mesh and the next step would be to add the eyes and the nose but before we do that remember to save the file and not lose all your progress okay so I know I said that we were gonna add the eyes and the nose but before we do that let's actually just sculpt a little bit and, and get our feet wet okay uh, because up till this point we've all we've been doing is just uh, using the grab brush really so um, let's select the mesh hit control tab go to sculpt mode and head over to the remesh drop down up here 
and hit remesh. And that will basically give the character a new set of faces that are much more equally distributed, right? And it will also join all the different parts together into one. Now the problem with this is that it lost a lot of those original shapes, uh, specifically the ears. So I'm going to redo this. So yeah, we can just undo that and try again. So I will turn down the voxel size by quite a lot. Remesh again. And um, yeah, I think I'm going to try a lower number. There you go. That, that seems better. So let's turn off the wireframes. They're, they're just getting in the way now. And uh, let's start sculpting. Now we're going to move away from the grab brush. I'm going to select the elastic deform. It's basically the same thing as the grab brush, except that it's much softer and it, it affects a larger area. So if I use the grab brush now, you'll see that it kind of destroys the mesh. It's pretty destructive using the grab brush at this point. And this is happening because it, the, there are just way too many polygons now, too many faces. The elastic deform, on the other hand, makes pretty large scale softer changes so if i want to change the shape of the head uh, fix some of the proportional issues that i see here the elastic deform is a much better choice so let's go ahead and use that now as you can see it's a little too faceted so we can smooth out the faces and this happened because I kept the hard edges. I didn't shade smooth. So if you want to get rid of this before remeshing, use shade smooth and it's going to give you a, a smoother surface from the beginning. I don't really mind the faceted look because it can give me a pretty clear indication of where the forms are, you know, where the side of the face is, where the front is and everything. Now be careful not to lose all the volume. You can go pretty hard with the smooth brush. Uh, like I covered before, you can destroy all the forms that you have. So make sure that you're, you have a pretty light touch. Turn down the strength if you have to, but don't destroy everything that you've worked on. I'm going to turn off the floor and the axes because I don't need them anymore. They're distracting. Okay, let's switch to the draw sharp brush. And that allows us to carve into the surface. So I want to make this, uh, this eye line really, really apparent. And I also want to carve in the shape of the ear, you know, the, the inside forms. Now you'll see that it affects the backside as well. So we can actually stop that from happening. Go over to the tools tab and under advanced, I can turn on front faces only. And now it will not affect the back. Now the back side is showing up in the front though. So we got to be careful about, you know, the thickness of our meshes. Now, if the depth of this is a little too thin, I can use the inflate brush, turn up the size a little bit and just go over the ears a couple times and it will inflate it. It will give it more depth. Now let's switch to the clay strips brush and I will carve in the cavities for the eyeballs. He's going to have those big googly eyes. So I want a big, like big orbital area here. Now the last brush I want to introduce you to for now is the scrape brush. This can be a really cool addition to your tool set. And what this does is just like the name suggests, it scrapes the surface of the mesh. So you can use it to simplify a lot of the different, you know, planes on, on the, on the model that you're working on. Now, I don't want to add too many details on the torso because it'll be covered by the shirt and I think I'm going to give him a hoodie as well. And, and quick sketches like this, uh, you know, where we're just finding the character. This is not supposed to be like the final, uh, the final thing that I use in a game or, or in an animation. This is just me trying to find out the design, right? So for things like this, you want to spend time, you want to prioritize where you spend your time, right? You don't want to work on things that no one will ever see. 
and no one will ever know. So uh, in this case, for example, I don't want to work on the torso because it will be covered. So whenever the form becomes too lumpy, I just use the scrape brush and flatten it and simplify it. Stylized characters tend to have clean surfaces and again that's because the read, the immediate graphic read of the character needs to be easy to understand. It needs to be really uh, simple so that the viewer, the person looking at it can get exactly the information that, that they need to understand who the character is. Um, if you have a lot of tiny details, a, a lot of bumps and lumps, those can be distracting. And unless those are actually part of, you know, the character, they're an important feature, you should try and remove as many of those bumps and lumps as you can. Now I actually want to add a separate mesh for the nose. It's going to give me more control. So let's remove this protrusion. It was just there to um, have a quick representation of the nose anyway. So there is no reason to keep it any longer. Now the clay strips brush, we can uh, sort of build kind of a muzzle for the mouth. So the mouth actually kind of comes out of the surface a little bit. It's wrapped around the teeth. It's not flat. A lot of beginners, they think of the mouth as like a, a horizontal line across the face, and that is not the case. It actually comes out a little bit. It protrudes. But I still want to be careful here. I am working with a stylized character in mind, uh, so, you know, I don't actually want to break the silhouette of the face too much. Okay, so I will keep it fairly flat. Just working out the kinks here. Now with the draw sharp brush, I can hold control and pull out some of the forms. Yeah, I don't think I'm too happy with the ears, so I think I'm going to change them. They're no longer going to be Ron stoppable ears. I think I want to make them a lot more, a lot straighter. You know, something that mimics the lines of the face. So it's still not too late to make large scale changes. We're still in the early stages of the sculpt, but later it's going to be much harder to do that because we will have all the all the different elements in place and changing that the tiniest thing can can create a lot of work for us all right making the eyes is pretty simple just add a sphere rotate on the x axis by 90 degrees scale it down and let's place it right there okay now we need a mirror modifier and this time, let's use the mirror object function here. So let's choose the head, and that will make the eyeballs actually mirror across the center of the head. Move it inwards. Yeah. So let's, uh, let's make the eyelids. So I will duplicate this mesh, Shift D, and scale the duplicate just a little bit. Not too much, just uh, enough so that, you know, you have a little bit of thickness to the eyelids. All right, let's hit tab, go to edit mode. Actually, first I'm going to isolate it with forward slash. Then I'm going to hit tab, shift Z to go into wireframe mode. And let's select the bottom half. Make sure to check around and have a clean selection. All right, now let's tap Y. And that is going to separate the top from the bottom. Bring everything back by hitting forward slash again. And now I'm going to rotate this on the x-axis. And let's go ahead and rotate the top as well. All right. And now let's give him a solidify modifier. And let's give the eyelids a little bit of thickness here. And lo and behold, we have eyes. Cool. So now we can, uh, you know, edit this a little bit more. Open up his eyes a little bit. 
The lower eyelids are usually a little bit behind the upper eyelids, so move it back. Let's go ahead and apply transforms for both of them. And apply the modifiers as well. Cool. Now let's select the head and go back to sculpt mode. And now I will make sure that everything fits around the eyeballs. So really just making sure that the eyes are actually part of the head and not just stuck on, on top of it because after this we will be joining them and merging them together. Now another question that beginners ask is uh, do I need to know anatomy? And the answer again for this one as well is yes and no. In my experience it, it depends really on what you're trying to make. If you're making something really stylized then you know basic artistic principles like composition, color choices, shape language and, and you know the common artistic principles between all the all the different mediums that is what's going to benefit you more so a sense of proportion is more important than uh, than specific knowledge of like bones and muscles but if you want to work with realism then yes knowledge of anatomy is going to be pretty necessary for you and really after a certain point both the art styles can learn from each other so if you want to go for the stylized route then you can take a lot from actually learning about the muscles and, and, and the bones and the structure of the human body. And if you're a, uh, a realistic sculptor, you, would, you can learn a lot from like the composition and the character design elements that the stylized character artists, they tend to rely on. So you can, even if uh, it doesn't matter which side you are on, you can grow from learning from the other, from the other side. So I'm just trying to find an appealing shape here. Obviously, if uh, we were working with an actual concept, then this stuff would have been solved for us already. But I'm, I'm trying to find what works for the character that I want to make. So I'm trying to get the top of this jaw to be straight. And from over here, I'm looking at this curve. This is a pretty interesting angle and if you nail this then your character is going to have pretty appealing forms. I learned that from Dylan Ekron's streams and he's, a, he's an artist at Disney so you know you should check him out if you're interested in this sort of thing. Alright so with that done let's add a nose. Back to object mode. Add a cube again. Let's squish it and put it into place. It's a rectangular wedge shape on the face so it shouldn't be too hard. Kind of reminds me of Squidward now. So let's add a subsurf modifier, Control 2 again, and apply it. Scale it up. Apply transforms. I always apply the transforms out of habit. Okay, so it looks alright. Let's edit that in sculpt mode. Let's get this to look like something decent. Now, if you don't understand any part of the human body, feel free to look at references. Look at actual noses of people. And um, If you don't understand ears, then look at ears. You should always rely on references. You should never be shy about using them. Now, something that really helps me when I'm modeling stylized characters is if I switch this editor over to uh, another 3D viewport. And let's resize the window here. Remember to change the focal length to 85 because it, it has a lot of perspective distortion right now. And for these guys, I want to create a new material. Remove the existing material. Create a new one. And I don't want to use nodes here because in solid view, it doesn't show the material unless you turn the nodes off. And I'm going to come over here and switch to flat shaded. And I can choose a, a straight black color for this and apply the same material to the nose and the eyelids. I'm going to leave the eyes to be white because it gives us a pretty clear read of the eye shape. Now I don't want the materials to affect this editor here because I'm sculpting. 
So I'm going to head over to this drop down and instead of material, I'm going to switch to object. Let's turn off some of the extra stuff here. So turn off the floor and the axes. Oop, and the 3D cursor and the origin because I don't want any distraction from the silhouette. So now this forces me to look at the shape that I'm working with. And yeah, everything seems to be pretty okay. I don't, I, I don't think I want to make any major changes to uh, the character at this point. It's looking pretty decent for this stage. Except maybe I can work on the nose a little bit. I'm not too happy with the shape of the nose. Again, I'm just trying to make some interesting choices here, right? And that comes with not being afraid to change, uh, change any of the shapes at any point. You need to be comfortable playing with the forms and, and not be too tied down to any, any uh, decision at this point, okay? I'm also trying a little bit to break away from the, the straight Disney look because they have like a, a pretty set standard for the kind of characters that they make. Like they have a template for the, the male characters and the female characters. And I just want to break away from that a little bit. Not that I want to make something too alien. I do want to learn from them. I, I want to pick up the stuff that works uh, with their design. And I still want to change it to be kind of my own thing. But maybe it's just going to end up being very Disney. I don't know. Every stylized character is compared to Disney. I, I remember when Overwatch came out, there were like Disney characters in a game. And then Fortnite came out and then again, Disney characters in a game. So everything is Disney, just like everything is Dark Souls. I'm still kind of not sure about the eyes, which is why I'm still not joining them with the head. So let's actually use the grab brush to adjust the shape. Turn on topology. So now I can affect the upper eyelid separately from the lower eyelid. So again, I'm using this opportunity to add contrast to the shape of the eyelids. So you'll see that the middle part of the eyelid is a little thicker than both the ends, the inside and the outside end. They're, they're a bit more tapered than the middle part. And I'm constantly checking the shape that I'm getting here in the black and white view. It makes it easy to decide whether or not I want to stick with uh, with the changes that I made because you know it's it's free from all the distractions. It doesn't have any of the forms, so it's, uh, the forms are not distracting me. The shadows are not distracting me. It's just purely shape. So I think I'm going to color the iris as well. So isolate the eyeball and select the iris shape. So I'll assign the same black material to the iris. I think I want them to be a little bigger. So control plus to grow selection and hit assign. Control I to invert the selection. And here I will apply the white material. So now our judgments will be much more informed because we have the, uh, the irises in place. And right now he looks a little too sleepy. So let's go into edit mode, select the eyeballs with A and rotate them. Yeah, that's, that's a much more neutral expression. So tiny little changes can make a lot of difference. I'm doing the same tapering thing with the lower eyelid as well. Okay, let's add the eyelids to the head. Select both of them, press Control J. And select the eyes, right click, choose Shade Smooth. And that is going to remove the, the faceted look on the eyeballs. So let's go back into sculpt mode for the head and hit remesh. Whoa, so Blender forgot the setting that I had for the voxel size. So uh, let, let's undo that and let's use this picker to find out what the voxel size is. And so now it knows the voxel size and I'm going to hit remesh. Cool. So a little bit of cleanup is required. There are some issues with this, right? But it's pretty easy to fix them with the smooth brush. Just be very gentle with it. And let's also smooth out some of the transitions for the nose. So wherever the nose meets the face, it needs to be a lot smoother. And so now we can fill out some of the divots and the pits with the clay strips brush. Now you've got to be really careful about making marks on the surface uh, of stylized characters because every mark that you make, it can age the character a lot. 
So if you're not working on an older character, in our case, it's a pretty young guy, you got to be very careful with where you place the marks. Let's straighten out the eyelids and smooth out some of these transitions. So the draw sharp can always be used to accentuate the forms. And after using it, just go over it with the smooth brush and it will, it will make sure the transition is nice and smooth. And I kind of lost the middle part of the nose here, so I'm going to use the clay strip brush, add it back in. All right, so to make the lips, all you have to do is make a mark like this. This represents the parting of the lips. And then make another mark where the bottom of the lower lip is located. And just smooth out this part. Now holding control, we can pull out the shapes of the lips. So when you use Draw Sharp, normally it cuts into the surface. But if you hold control, it's going to pull it out. So this inverse function is part of all the brushes. You can hold control with any brush and it will invert its function. Okay, just make sure that uh, the lips look exactly like you want. Okay, I think the lips are located a little too low here, so I'm going to pull them up. And that obviously it messes with the shape, but I can just go over it again, clean it up. Again, this is a quick sculpt, a quick sketch. We don't need to be too precious with anything that we do. So just keep checking your model from all sides and you will find some imperfections that you can clean up. So, you know, wobbly lines that need to be straightened, uh, curved lines that need to be curvened. I don't know. <laughs> uh, they, they need to flow smoother. So let's just fix all that stuff and we'll be done with the head. Okay, time to give him some hair. So let's start with a sphere. And let's just move it into position. Apply transforms, scale it in. Cool, with that in place, let's jump to sculpt mode. And by now, I think you know the process, right? Just use the grab brush and uh, make the largest, the biggest shapes first, and then work on the smaller shapes after that. Now, something that I remind myself of when I'm working on projects like this is that it is going to look awful till the very end when everything comes together. Okay. So that feeling of, Oh no, it doesn't, it doesn't look right. It just does not feel like what I want it to feel like. It is going to eventually go away, hopefully by the end. Near the end, you can actually see what you were working on. Uh, but before that point, everything just looks awful. Okay. So don't beat yourself up too much if it just doesn't look the way that you want it to. And there are two things about the hair that we can adjust to affect the, the age of the character. Okay. The first thing is the volume of the hair. So younger characters tend to have a lot more volume. And the second thing is the hairline. So older characters, especially males, they tend to have receding hairlines. Whereas with younger characters, you would have much fuller, you know, uh, the hairline is going to cover, is going to be straighter. It's going to not have like that widow's peak kind of thing going on. Okay, I'm going to remesh it. Remesh it again till we find a nice amount of polygons. So I'm using the scrape brush to introduce a little bit of planarity on the surface here. The hair uh, tends to be a lot more chaotic, you know, a lot more organic than the face. Uh, the face has more structure. It's more rigid, whereas the hair, it has structure, but it, it's, uh, it's a lot more freeform, a lot more free flowing. So before we get into that, let's simplify the structure of the hair. 
He's got some mutton chops. I, I don't think I want to keep that. And now at this point, I want to turn off the mirror function of the sculpt mode. So let's press that. And asymmetry always adds a lot more interest into your character. So add that wherever you can. Again, it's, it's the same principle as the principle of contrast. I'm going to start with a parting line here. And let's use the elastic deform brush. Actually, I think the grab brush would be a better choice because we, we want to disrupt the shape, right? The elastic deform, it tries to keep the shape as, as best as it can. Pull this out. Select the draw sharp. So I'm just trying to segment the bands of hair. And as you can see, this doesn't have a lot of resolution right now, so I'm going to remesh. So again, I'm thinking about the silhouette and how to break it. So I'm pulling out a couple of hair strands here and there. It is pretty messy, but I'm not really concerned about that. This is a sketch. I'm going to give him that wavy hair. So sometimes what happens is that it starts lagging because there are way too many polygons. So I'm going to remesh this again, but this time I'm going to turn up the voxel size. So that means less polygons and in turn less detail, but it allows us to work much more, uh, much more interactively because it's a lot more responsive. Now for areas like this, like the part line, where the two sides are way too far apart. Going over them with the inflate brush can actually bring them closer together. So this is great for things like scars and cuts and bruises. And we also want to give the hair some volume, so this is a good brush to use. So this lick here, it seems interesting enough, but I think I'm going to have to balance that because right now, a lot of the weight of the head is on the right side and it's not being balanced. So just keep working on this and feel free to make changes. Don't be too stuck on one idea. And if you don't like something, just move on, try something else. So I'm looking at the silhouette when I'm doing this. And I'm trying to make an interesting shape where the hairline meets the forehead. Remesh it again. Sometimes we can, we can push the geometry too far and we need to remesh it just so that we get like a, a fresh, um, a fresh layout of polygons. It works better sometimes. I'm trying to make the hair flow better. Now there's another pretty cool brush. It's called uh, the snake hook brush, and we can use that to pull out some forms like this. Okay, so it can make uh, very short work of things like tentacles and vines and, and hair, stuff like that. It's a little hard to control. Um, if you're not careful with it, it can cause a lot of distortion in the mesh, but uh, it is a pretty powerful brush. I'll just clean up some stuff a little bit, and then we can make sure that these uh, the form changes are pretty sharp and pretty noticeable. They were all kind of bland. They had no contrast. So I'm adding a little bit of sharpness to the edges here. And again, you don't want that everywhere. A little hint of sharpness here and there is good enough. It's not, you don't want to like sharpen every single edge on the model. Okay. That is again, not contrast. If every edge is sharp, it means that you would need to introduce softer edges to add contrast. So now he looks like he has two horns, which could be interesting. So I'm going to add some more volume. So yeah, I think I'm going to stop here for the hair. Um, if this was going to be like the final mesh, then I would need to polish up the hair a lot more. But since this is a quick sculpt, this is as far as I go. 
and I just realized we have no eyebrows, so let's let's add them in real quick. I'm going to start with a plane, hit tab for edit mode. Now I'll press M for the merge menu, and I will collapse everything. So now we have a single vertex. Now go up here and turn on the snapping function. It's the magnet icon. And under this dropdown, choose face and project individual elements. Turn that on as well. So now at this point, this vertex is going to stick to the surface. See that? So let's place it right there and E to extrude. Select the edge and extrude that and keep extruding it till we get the eyebrow shape. Now let's tab back out to object mode and let's again add a solidify here. Add some thickness. And then I want to give him the other eyebrow, so mirror modifier. So now we have a basic eyebrow shape that we can go ahead and sculpt. Okay, and, and sculpting here is just, you know, reshaping it. It's not, I'm not going to add any details. Just pushing and pulling the points. I want his eyebrows to be kind of bushy. I'm going to give him some thick eyebrows. And as you can see, eyebrows add a lot to the expression. So, you know, don't forget to make them like I did. Now, I don't want him to be angry. He looks a little angry. So let me change that. Yeah, now he just looks like he's like done with you rather than straight up angry. And it looks pretty decent in the silhouette view as well. Now in object mode, let's select it and apply the modifiers. Right click, shade smooth. Now that gets rid of the faceting, but now it looks like there's a piece of turd on his head. So um, go to the mesh data tab and under normals, we're going to turn on auto smooth and that's going to fix the weird shading issue. All right, so he's naked. Time to give him some clothes. Now to make the shirt, we will paint a mask and extract that. Okay, let's see how that works. Let's go down to the mask brush. The hotkey for that is M. I'll turn up the strength to one and turn off the pen pressure. You really want to make sure that there are no holes in the mask. Otherwise, there would be a hole in the shirt. So it's a pretty simple thing. Just go ahead and paint the mask that is going to represent the shape of the shirt. Okay, let's tune that, uh, that neck size a bit. I'm going to turn down the size. And if we hold control, it will erase the mask. So using both in tandem will give us a clean mask. All right, let's go to the mask menu and choose to extract the mask. Now, I don't want to project to the sculpt because otherwise it would take into account the, the clavicle that we sculpted here. And, um, it would project that onto the shirt. So let's turn that off. And I want to extract as a solid, hit OK. Cool, so we have a pretty nice uh, shirt mesh. So now let's go to sculpt mode. And if you actually try to sculpt, nothing's going to happen. And that's because it's still masked. So we got to go up to the mask menu and clear the mask. And now we can sculpt. So select an actual sculpting brush before doing that. All right, let's go ahead and turn down the strength. And let's fill in some of these details that we don't need. So I just want a simple t-shirt. Nothing too fancy here. So implying detail here is more important than actually putting in the detail. Let's put in a seam line right there. And another seam line that represents the top of the sleeves. And now let's, uh, let's use the grab brush and fix some of the shapes. All right, cool. So now let's make the hoodie. So let's go back to the head mesh and go over to sculpt mode, isolate this, and we can see that the mask we painted is still there. So this is something to keep in mind. The masks that we paint, they remain there till we clear them. Okay, so let's switch over to the mask brush with M. So now it's selected and let's turn down the brush size and let's clear out the front of the mask here.
All right, cool. So let's go back to mask and extract, hit OK. And we have a little bit of a problem down here. So let's just delete that mesh and try again. Okay, so this time we'll make sure that uh, the mask is completely gone from the underside. Okay, so let's check around to see if there are any stray masked areas. So it seems okay now, let's try it again. Cool, so let's come out of isolation mode. Scale it up a little bit. Apply transforms. And go into sculpt mode. And let's, uh, let's pull out the hoodie here to be above the shirt. Oh, and it looks like some of the points are still masked. So remember to clear the mask with Alt-M. And now it's pretty simple. Just uh, lay it on top of the shirt. Make sure it doesn't intersect. So using control with the elastic deform brush or the grab brush, what that does is it can pull out the surface and it can push in the surface. And normally the way that those brushes work is that they push and pull to the side, right? So if you just want to pull towards you or push away from you, you can hold down control. Okay, so it's supposed to be a hoodie and so we want an actual hood part. So let's bring in a sphere and make sure it's in place. Let's go to sculpt mode and shape it. Now I want to pull this part to the front and make sure that the hoodie is snug against the body because then it'll feel like it has some weight. And it's time to remesh. Now let's use the draw sharp tool to create some folds and uh, give it a little more interest. Okay, let's change this a little bit. It's coming straight down, so make it follow the, the rim of the hoodie. Okay, so I think it's time to introduce a little bit of asymmetry, so I'll turn off the symmetry function. And let's add some asymmetry because that's just how clothes work. Now the back here is, I don't think I'm going to render from the back. I'm not going to show the back in the final render, I think. But still, I want to um, add a little bit of that contrast and asymmetry. And now for our final move, we're going to add those, um, what are they called? Laces? Laces in the front of the hoodie that you can use to tighten. Okay, so this time, let's start with a curve. All right, let's move it into place. Hit tab for edit mode. And let's select this curve point and move it right there. Now for the second point, I want to place that and rotate it with R. I'm going to turn off snapping here because I actually want this to dangle off of the model. So pull that down and rotate the top point too. Cool. Okay, so also make sure that the curve is not too straight. You know, gravity is pulling it down but it's, it shouldn't be completely straight. Now let's duplicate that for the other side and move these points into place as well. Now the reason why I'm working on both of the curves separately and not just using the mirror modifier is because I want them both to, be, um, to not be symmetrical. Okay, so with that done, let's go to the curve tab here and under geometry, we can increase the depth and that is going to add a cylindrical shape on top of the curve. So let's do that for the other one as well. Okay, so we have like a tube-like surface for the laces. Okay, so let's add those tiny things, plastic things at the end of laces, where they're called aglets. Uh, let's start with a cube. And to zoom into what we're working on, we can hit the period key, and that's going to frame the selection. Right, so now I'm going to add a loop with Control-R and place it at the bottom 
So now when we add our favorite modifier with control two, it retains the bottom shape much better than the top and it gives us the aglet shape. Okay, right click shade smooth. And in this case, I want to turn on auto smooth as well. A to select all, S to scale. That seems about the right size. Now I'm going to duplicate that over to the other side. Cool, I think it's good enough. So yeah, we're basically done with the mesh. We're done with the modeling phase. So I'm going to go around this guy, give it a once over, see what needs to be adjusted, and then we'll move on. Okay, so with that done, I think we should give our guy a bit of color and render him out. So let's start with the head mesh and head over to vertex paint. And now we can choose the color up here. Something like this. This is good, I think. And just fill it in. So on the right, we can actually just see the flat shaded colors without any lighting information. That should help us uh, with our color choices. All the other pieces are getting in the way, so I'm going to isolate it with the forward slash key. The reason why I'm not turning on the symmetry mode here is because it creates some irregularities between the left and the right side. So they, they don't both end up looking the same. Okay, so I use this opportunity to introduce some more asymmetrical elements. So just go ahead and fill it in. There's nothing too complicated about this. To get a good vertex paint going, we need a lot of vertices. So something like this is only really possible when we have uh, very dense meshes like this. Okay, so low poly meshes don't really work very well with vertex painting. So for them, we would need to unwrap the meshes and then paint, um, paint on image files so that we could get details. But here, since we have enough polygons, we can just go ahead and paint directly on the mesh. So the brushes are pretty easy to understand. Uh, the smear brush can be used to extend the color and the average brush can be used to mix the colors with whatever you have selected up at the top left. So we have red zones, which would be around um, the ears, the, the nose, and the cheeks. And then we have the blue zones, which would be around the eyes and around the jaw. And then we have the yellow zones, which are places where uh, the bone is closer to the skin. So there's very little fat, for example, in the forehead, and that would be much more yellow than um, other places. So when I say blue around the eyes, I don't mean that there is like a, a saturated band of blue across the eyes. I mean like uh, a hint of blue. So you could have, you could start with the skin color and then shift it, hue shift it towards blue a bit. And that would be the color that you paint. So now let's give him some red in the cheeks. And it looks a little too sunburnt, so I'm going to try and average this out. So it's pretty hard for the light to reach under the jaw. And so if we add a darker color under there, it would help with our renders. Okay, for his lips, I don't want to make them too red. Uh, so I'm going to... I'm going for something like a darker shade of the skin. So I'm going to turn on wireframe to see where the lips are actually located. It's pretty hard to figure out where they are in flat shaded mode. So we just fill them in. And now it looks like dead skin instead of lips. So I think I'm going to have to add a, a bit of red.
and back to object mode. And really quickly, let's fill in the rest of the stuff here. So for the hair and the eyebrows, I think I'm going to go for like a darker color. But you don't want to use 100% black because you don't find uh, things in real life that are 100% black or 100% white. Okay, there's always color in them. It's not, it's not completely black or white. So a darker shade of brown would be more accurate than just straight up black. So let's do the same thing for the hair. A flat red for the shirt. And like a dark navy blue for the jacket. So for the hoodie part, I think I'm going to go with like a green color so that would complete the, the trifecta, you know, RGB, the three primary colors. And that kind of color scheme always seems to work for like main characters. You can't really vertex paint curves because they don't have any vertices. So I'm going to select both of them and convert them to uh, meshes first. So with those selected, I'm going to head to the object menu, convert to mesh from curve. And now it's an actual mesh object with vertices and everything, so I can paint it. And I'm going to add a darker color to the hair just because it gives it more depth. So for the eyes, I want to select the irises and duplicate them uh, to make them separate objects first. I'm going to select them. And now I'll duplicate the faces. Now with that done, I will separate my selection. And that makes the irises separate objects. And the reason why I did this is because it's now easier to paint the irises. Cool, so now we're basically done with the colors. And I want to add a little bit of asymmetry, some more asymmetry, because he's just looking straight at us. And, you know, that could work fine, but I, I just wanted to add some more interest. So I'm going to introduce you to a new brush. It's called the Pose Brush, and it allows us to pose the model. Just make sure that you have a, a large enough radius because otherwise uh, you'll be affecting a, a pretty small area and it's going to do some wonky stuff. So make sure that the radius is big enough and add some asymmetry. There we go. So it does create some deformations that we would need to clean up, but I think the pose brush adds a, a pretty neat functionality to the blender tool set now the problem is at the moment it doesn't allow us to affect multiple objects at the same time or at least i haven't found a way to do that uh, so i'm gonna have to look deeper into that but uh, it's pretty easy to adjust these things and put them back in place So I just have to be a little careful when I'm adjusting this. Um, be careful not to destroy the work that we did, but still add a little bit of interest. So yeah, we're done with that. Um, let's move on to creating some really quick materials. So I'm going to first head over to the rendered mode. And I'm going to pull out another editor and switch that over to the shader editor and um, let's work on the shader. So it's pretty easy, just create a new material. I'm gonna call it skin. And for the base color, we need to bring in the vertex color that we just painted. So Shift A. So there you go, vertex color. I'll plug that. And nothing's actually gonna show up because we don't have any lights in the scene. So let's do that, let's add a light. So a simple point light will do just fine. 
I want it to illuminate the front of the face. I'm going to increase the intensity to about 500 watts. And finally, remember to turn on use nodes because otherwise it would just ignore all the nodes that we're adding. And now we can actually see um, the vertex color that we plugged in. So if we turn up subsurface here, it's going to start emulating subsurface scattering, which is the effect of light passing through skin. Now the problem is that when subsurface is active, it ignores the base color and it takes the subsurface color. So we're going to need to plug that into the subsurface color as well. Now we'll turn down the subsurface effect because it was a bit too much. And I'm going to put the light away because it was uh, too bright and it was washing out the colors. And now let's duplicate the light. And this is going to be the fill light. Okay. So this needs to be much less intense than the main light. So I'm going to turn this down. Now to affect the color that's coming through the skin, we can go to subsurface radius. These values, they represent RGB. So red, green, and blue, and we can we can change this to affect the the kind of the color that's coming through when light passes through the skin. So I think I'm going to overdrive the red component, and that will make it more stylized. The light here is just plain white, so let's give it a warm warm tint. And the fill light, I want to give it more of a blue tint. Now this is basic lighting technique, warm light versus cool light. It's again, the concept behind this, the principle behind this is contrast. So now I'm going to create a new material for the hair. Bring in the vertex color and plug it in. And for the eyebrows, I don't need to create a new material. I will just select the hair material and it's the same process for the clothes. I could actually use the same material for everything except maybe the head uh, because of the subsurface effect. And the reason why I'm not is because it offers me a separate control. And once we've made the clothing material, let's apply it to all the clothes. I mean, for the small amount of work that we did, I think this looks fairly okay so now let's bring in an hdr okay that is a high dynamic range image and that what that does is it simulates an environment and it gives us a very a very complex lighting scenario that we would not be able to replicate by placing lights by hand so let's go here to color and bring in an image texture and just hit open and locate the image that you want so I've just gone ahead um, and downloaded an image from HDRI Haven. It's free to use. So for me, it was a pretty warm environment. And so now we can play around with the different materials and um, kind of fine tune the look. All right, so with that set up, let's go back to solid mode and I'm gonna add a cube. Now this is going to represent the background of the image. So I'm gonna select these faces here and delete them. And uh, let's apply a new material to the background as well so we can control the color. Okay, switch to rendered mode and this is what it looks like. Let's quickly adjust the, the positions of the lights. And I'm trying different colors for the background, trying to find out what looks best. It's really all about taste at this point. What colors you choose uh, is a very personal thing and you just need to be confident with your color choices. So let's head over to the render tab here and switch our render engine from EV to cycles. And the difference between them is that EV is a real time engine. It tries to emulate a game engine, whereas cycles is a ray tracing engine. So it's a lot more precise and the results are much closer to reality. So that pretty much covers everything I wanted to in this video. Uh, the only thing left is to render the scene, which, uh, which needs a camera. So let's bring in one and place it where you want to. And when we hit zero on the number pad, it shows us what the camera is actually looking at. And then we can use the G key to grab the camera and place it. 
and R key to rotate it and find the exact angle that we want. Now finally, to render something, we can go up to the render menu and render the image. Now this is the result from Eevee. I'm going to switch to Cycles now and render it again. The Cycles engine takes a longer time to render, obviously, but uh, it's, uh, it's a much more precise render. And I kind of like the look of this. It looks like a miniature. And that is it for this video. Thank you so much for watching this far, guys. I think I'm going to try for a shorter video next time because, as you might have noticed, I kind of lost my voice by the end. I'm not used to talking that much. And I think the YouTube algorithm, it, it likes shorter videos anyway. So you've been on YouTube. You know what to do. Like and subscribe. Uh, comment below to let me know how I can improve. I will be covering a lot about game development here. So things like art, visual effects, programming, game design. Um, everything that is related to game development, I will try and cover that on this channel. And that's about it. So I'll sign off here. Bye.